Thanks, Mace. Thanks, Pamela. <clears throat> nice to be here with you guys. Just got back from the East Coast, so that's why I was gone for three weeks, and I don't think I could have taught at 10.30 <laughs> Eastern Time. I would have been a vegetable. Um, so I appreciate, uh, I know Jeff subbed and guided a Feeding Your Demons at the end of April practice, and then uh, Venerable Tenzin Chuki uh, taught last week, I heard was wonderful. And of course, Eve, always fabulous. So it's good to be back, and I hope you are all well. It's a true refuge here. I'm so grateful for the SFDC, my, one of my favorite Dharma homes. And uh, it's good to see people coming back and uh, and feeling the love through our interconnected two-dimensional screen. <laughs> like, when is this? Well, I mean, will this ever end? Yes, yes, it will. Yes, it will. It will. It will. Yeah. Yeah, let's break out, break out, break out of the box. But we're here and we're making the best of the situation and, uh, you know, still here. <laughs> and uh, let's go ahead and drop in. I'd love to guide a meditation on loving kindness. We'll start with some breath work. And the reason I want to do a loving kindness, just to set this up while you get settled in and make sure you're cozy and comfortable, <clears throat> is that often people think that Tibetan uh, tradition doesn't have loving-kindness practice, but it does. It does. Sometimes I've heard even Dharma teachers who've been around for quite a while say, oh, the Tibetan version of loving-kindness is Tonglen. But that's actually not true. We have the loving-kindness, metta. We have compassion practice, which is Tonglen in, in the Tibetan tradition. And then we also have uh, beautiful practices on cultivating mudita, which is empathetic or sympathetic joy. And then um, upeka or upeksha, which is equanimity. That's all in there because, guess why? It is fundamental, foundational Buddhism. And Tibetan tradition inherited from Mother India, the Vajrayana, which is actually includes the Mahayana and the earlier streams, the Theravada lineages, all wrapped up into one big kind of three-cycle phase of teachings that traveled up to Tibet. They value the early teachings, the sutras of the Buddha, immensely. And when you, like for example, the monastics spend, I don't know, five, six years memorizing the sutras, meditating on them, debating them, and only then do they learn the higher teachings, or the kind of later teachings, I should say, because higher, lower um, is a misnomer. And these four measurables of, or the Brahma Viharas, the divine abodes, also later called the four measurables, that, and that's what usually the Tibetans call them, the Tsemeji. The Tsemeji means the four measurables, meaning that these qualities of love, compassion, joy, and equanimity become immeasurable when they are fused with our deepest heartfelt wish to be of benefit, to extend this loving care to all beings. And when it's done in the awareness of shunyata, emptiness, then it becomes limitless because we recognize uh, the interdependent nature of all of our path and fruition. And so in that way, my practice is not just for me or my family or my loved ones. It extends out to encompass infinite space. <laughs> and so because I heard that recently with a wonderful Dharma teacher, but saying, oh, the Tibetan version of loving kindness is Donglen, I thought, oh, well, let's Let's explore that a little bit and correct that, because that is not true. The Tibetan practice for loving-kindness is loving-kindness. <laughs> and the Tibetan practice for compassion is Donglen, which uh, many of us are familiar with because we have been uh, exploring those that practice, which is so integral in the Lojong slogans of mind training. So let's enjoy a deep dive into metta, 
in Pali or Maitri in Sanskrit, which simply means a kind of a friendliness or a, a loving care. And so go ahead and make yourself comfortable. Settle into a seat that feels good for you. Allow the eyes to close, at least in the beginning, to f encourage the mind and the sense stimuli to quiet down. Turn inward and take some deep breaths, releasing tension with the out-breath. Feeling free to sigh if you wish, shake out the neck, the shoulders relax, down the back, arms soft. The hands can be resting on your thighs, palms down or in your lap, facing up, either way. Feel the belly as you breathe. Breathing into the belly, the kidneys, the side body, and then with the out breath, relax, release any tension or holding in the face, the shoulders, the back, the belly, the hips. If the mind is swirling, let it release into the body like a an autumn leaf, leaf falling from the tree. Just drifting down, 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 lightly touching the earth. The mind suffusing the entire field of the body from the soles of the feet to the crown of the head. And let's take a moment to give rise to a personal heartfelt motivation for our life and our practice. I'd like to share a beautiful quote from Walt Whitman. He said, I am larger, better than I thought. I did not know I held so much goodness. I am larger, better than I thought. I did not know I held so much goodness. Let that sink in to you. It's from this spirit, this flavor, that we come to our limitless loving-kindness practice. And loving-kindness, like Donglen, uses words, images, and feelings to evoke the quality of loving care, of friendliness, metta, towards oneself, towards others. With each recitation of the metta phrases that you'll hear in a moment, we are expressing an intention of planting the seeds of loving wishes over and over in our heart. Let your body be relaxed, letting go of mental activity as much as possible. Feeling the breath in the body. Coming into this present moment. And letting go of any plans or preoccupations. And like in Tonglen, with metta, we begin first with ourself. We begin with ourself because without loving ourself, it is difficult to love others. 
And sometimes this is perhaps even the most challenging step, but let's give it a try. Beginning with ourself, we breathe gently and recite inwardly the following traditional phrases directed towards your own well-being. And you can repeat internally or out loud. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be filled with loving kindness. And may I be safe from inner and outer dangers. May I be safe from inner and outer dangers. Really let this land in you repeating it a few times. And may I be well in body and mind. May I be well in body and mind. Really wishing that for yourself. be at ease and happy. May I be at ease and happy. As you repeat these phrases, picture yourself as you are now and hold that image in a loving heart of metta. We'll do another cycle in a moment, but if it's hard for you to picture yourself as you are now, it may be easier to picture yourself as a young and beloved child. In either case, feel free to adjust the words and images in any way you wish. Creating the exact phrases that best open your heart of kindness. Repeating these phrases over and over again, letting the feelings permeate your body and mind. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be filled with loving kindness. May I be safe from inner and outer dangers. May I be safe from inner and outer dangers. May I be safe from inner and outer dangers. May I be well in body and mind. 
May I be well in body and mind. May I be well in body and mind. May I be at ease and happy. May I be at ease and happy. May I be at ease and happy. aware that this meditation may at times feel mechanical or awkward, or it can bring up feelings contrary to loving kindness, feelings of irritation and anger even. And if this happens, it is especially important to be patient and kind toward yourself, allowing whatever arises to be received in a spirit of friendliness and kind affection. Spend a few more moments with these phrases, really letting them permeate your being. Even making up your own phrases here, prayers for your life. When you feel you have established some stronger sense of loving kindness for yourself, you can then expand your meditation to include others. So after focusing on yourself now, choose a loved one. Someone in your life who has loved and truly cared for you. And picture this person in front of you, as clearly as you can, or just feel their presence if that's easier. You may get flashes or flickers of imagery. It's okay if it's not perfectly stable. And when you see them or feel them here in the space with you, reciting these same phrases, May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be safe from inner and outer dangers. May you be safe from inner and outer dangers. May you be safe from inner and outer dangers. If 
feel how your heart responds to this wish for them, this loved one. May you be well in body and mind. May you be well in body and mind. May you be well in body and mind. May you be at ease and happy. May you be at ease and happy. You may even let the outbreath carry that prayer to them. May you be at ease and happy. The inhale can resource the heart, resource your compassion. The outbreath can carry the prayer to them, an offering of generosity with the outbreath. Spend a few more moments with this loved one, even making up or adjusting the prayers to fit whatever you'd like to say. Let the image and feelings you have for your loved one support the meditation. Whether the image or feelings are clear or not doesn't matter. In meditation, they will be subject to change. So just simply continue to plant the seeds of loving wishes, repeating the phrases gently no matter what arises. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be safe from inner and outer dangers. May you be well in body and mind. May you be at ease and happy. Now gradually begin to include other people in your meditation. Picturing each beloved person and recite inwardly these same phrases, evoking a sense of loving kindness for each person in turn. So you can kind of roam freely in your imagination. Who comes to mind and then offer these phrases or variations on these phrases to each of them.
May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be safe from inner and outer dangers. May you be well in body and mind. And may you be at ease and happy. And now begin to expand the circumference of your practice. Spend some time wishing well to a wider circle of friends. Gradually extend your meditation to picture and include community members, neighbors, people everywhere, animals, eventually expanding to all beings in the whole earth. May you be filled with loving kindness. And specifically focus on places that are hot spots of suffering, violence, Palestine, Israel, India, all around the world. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be safe from inner and outer dangers. May you be safe from inner and outer dangers. May you be safe from inner and outer dangers. Like a mantra. Reciting these. Feeling them extend out on blessing waves filling all of space. May you be well in body and mind. May you be well in body and mind. May you be well in body and mind. May you be at ease and happy. May you be at ease and happy. May you be at ease and happy. And finally, if you haven't already, begin to include the difficult people in your life, even your enemies, and wishing that they too may be filled with loving kindness and peace. This can take practice, but as your heart opens 
first to loved ones and friends, you'll begin to find that in the end you won't want to close the heart anymore, even to those who challenge you. You can imagine specific people in front of you or groups, people that we would normally deem as evil, the enemy. See if you can extend this loving kindness to them even. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be filled with loving kindness. May you be safe from inner and outer harm. May you be safe from inner and outer harm. May you be safe from inner and outer harm. May you be well in body and mind. May you be well in body and mind. May you be well in body and mind. And may you be at ease and happy. May you be at ease and happy. May you be at ease and happy. Let the mind roam to other people you may want to include in the last few minutes. Just continuing with these phrases or your own phrases. I'll sit in silence for a few more minutes.
Gently release any visualization, any imagery or effort, and just rest now for a few moments in a simple, non-doing meditation. Letting go of any effort and just rest, free of elaboration, free of any grasping or distraction. Just let the mind settle in its natural state. Like soot in a pool of water settling down. As the mind settles, the water becomes more clear. That water is the mind. Just rest. They're not open already, you could even open your eyes, but stay in the meditative mode and feel that quality of awareness permeating the visual field, impressions. There's a clarity and yet there's a freedom. Almost a feeling of sitting back in your seat and having a broader, more lantern consciousness rather than a spotlight consciousness. Suffused awareness with mindfulness. And then we can come back And acknowledging that this practice of loving kindness can really be done anywhere. You can use this in a traffic jam or in the market or on an airplane. You can do this silently amongst people. They don't even know. And it brings about a wonderful sense of connection with people around you. This power of loving kindness can really be brought into your life in any situation. And uh, I thought um, tonight I would kind of pepper the evening with some devotion, just like the phrases we said in English of metta, like mantras. We can also chant literal mantras in Sanskrit as a way to massage the heart space to open and maybe even some juice or rasa of Uh, devotion, watering the seeds of your own wisdom and compassion. So there's a mantra I want to share, and I'll play a little music along with it, and we're going to sing for a while. So right out of meditation, in a way, this mantra recitation is like an an enhancement for the loving kindness that we've cultivated. I'll chat the mantra in here. It's Om Tari Tutari Ture. Bodhicitta Swaha. This is the mantra for for the first Tara in the 21 Tara pantheon. So it takes the usual 10 syllable mantra of Om Tari Tutari Ture Swaha and inserts the word Bodhicitta between the last two words. Om Tari Tutari Ture Bodhicitta Svaha. Repeat after me. Om Tari Tutari Ture Bodhicitta Svaha. Now the T is not like a T where you spit the air out. It's not like a ta. It's a ta, ta. So the tongue goes up behind the front teeth. Om Tari Tari. Om Tari Tutari Ture Svaha. 
the R also, Americans, sometimes we swallow our R's like R. It's not like that. It's more R, R, Om Tari, Om Tari, Tutari. It's the tongue at the top of the palate. Om Tari, Tutari, Turi, Swaha. Now this means, O Tara, please come swiftly, O Tara. Tara is the great mother. We can think of her as Mother Mary or Durga, Kali, Pragya Paramita, consciousness. Tara literally means she who saves. <clears throat> like a star, the North Star saves the sailors from peril. Mother Tara is like our North Star. Um, she it's set off in her vehicle as a boat. <laughs> And she sails in the vast uh, sky filled with infinite stars. Her name also does mean star. And uh, But really, the ultimate Tara is none other than you, <laughs> the nature of your own mind. And the word bodhicitta is this compassionate spirit or mind, heart-mind of awakening for the benefit of all beings. Svahas, may it be so. So, O Tara, please come swiftly, O Tara. Bodhicitta, may it be so. Awaken the, my heart of compassion, may it be so. sing as much or as little as you like. The point is not to sound perfect or good, it's more to open your heart and enjoy enjoy yourself. Listen to yourself sing and let go of it. Oh, 
Let's sit quietly for a few moments, just feeling the after effect, feeling Tara. Okay, let's come back. Thank you. So, slogan. <laughs> We're on number 40. We're towards the end here. So we'll, we'll spend a little time with this slogan of uh, for our class, and then we'll end with another Tara Mantra. So the fourth, 40th slogan is correct all wrongs with one intention. It's not too different from last week's, excuse me, in terms of 
the import of our intentions in our life. Another translation is counter all adversity with a single remedy. And I looked, I had time to look up the Tibetan. I don't always have time, but I did tonight. And the Tibetan is interesting. It's Loknun Tamche Chiki Ja. Anyone to repeat after me just to plant some karmic seeds with the Tibetan language? Lok nun. Lok nun. Lok nun. Tamche. Tamche. Chik. Gija. Gija. Chikija. <laughs> That's kind of a fun slogan, huh? Loknan tamche chiki ja. What does that mean? <laughs> yeah. So what's interesting is loknan literally means suppress or suppression, depending on the context. If you break it down into two words, lok has a meaning and nun has a meaning. And I and I like etymology in studying words. It helps us to understand the deeper meaning. And in this case, Lok literally means to reverse, to turn around, or revert. Nun also just on its own means suppression or to suppress if it's a verb. Tamche, tamche means all, like all. A-L-L. Tamche means all. Chik gija means to do, like now. It's like an imperative. And so what's interesting is like if if you if you break loknan into two, you could say turn, it's like turn all suppression, like like remedy it all. Um like counter, that's where this translation counter all adversity with a single remedy. So the chick here doesn't say there's no remedy in this word, but chick it, we're they're assuming we understand. The chick means the one remedy. So countering all adversity. It's like turn on it. Turn to face it. And apply the one remedy. Which is, of course, bodhicitta, right? That's why I wanted to do that mantra tonight. Bodhi means awakened. Chitta means heart-mind. It's the ch- the... the seat of the soul, chitta. So the mind of awakening, the spirit of awakening, this compassionate heart, this is really like the queen of dharma, bodhicitta. If you don't have it, you're a pauper, you know. <laughs> and Lojong is all about becoming rich in bodhicitta. And so we counter activity, we meet it with care, with compassion, with metta even, right? Because really bodhicitta includes all of those four measurables we explored earlier. It's everything. So I kind of like that second translation, correct all adversity with a single remedy. Loknan tamche chiki ja. Ja means to do. Gi is the instrumental. So do it with the one remedy. Uh, Judy Leaf, who is a teacher in the Shambhala tradition, she was a student of Chogyam Trungpa, she says that this particular slogan is about the power of establishing the attitude of mind training, lojong, as a kind of underlying habit of mind. It's your default mode as in the previous slogan that you did last week. Um, it is about the power of our intention. So what is behind our actions, our speech? What is the motivation? What are we coming with? And that really determines the outcome. So loknan tamche chikija. So Turn the tables on adversity with the one remedy. But she's also, Leaf is also saying that it's about 
establishing like a baseline attitude, like your outlook on life is mind training outlook, which is decreasing self-cherishing and increasing cherishing others, right? Which is how can I integrate this moment into my path? I just finished reading a fabulous book. It's the memoirs of Ram Dass called Being Ram Dass. How many people, has anybody read that book? It's very, very interesting. Very interesting to learn about his upbringing, his childhood with a privilege on the East Coast. And then, you know, discovering psychedelics through Timothy Leary at Harvard. He's a professor at Harvard in psychology. <laughs> And then his whole exploration of like searching for awakening through psychedelics. But always, you know, there's some benefit there, but still hungry. Not really finding what he was looking for. And then through the grace of God or Ram or Buddha, he discovered, he met uh, Neem Karoli Baba in the 60s late 60s, I think, or early 70s. And Neem Karoli Baba was an Indian saint, one of the greatest of our time. And he was affectionately called by his students Mah uh, Maharaji, Maharaji. And uh, phenomenal stories of him meeting Maharaji and just miracles occurring, mind reading, ways that um, Maharaji saw right through Ram Dass and really showed him unconditional love and showed him what he had been looking for all these, all these years through acid. <laughs> In fact, there's a story of Maharaja saying out of the blue, don't you have a medicine for the mind? <laughs> and Ram Dass said, well, uh, I have I have some aspirin here. He got out his medicine bag and started showing Maharaji all these different like Tylenol and Advil and different medications he had in his medicine bag. And Maharaji said, no, 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 not those, not those. The one for the mind. <laughs> what is it? The one that um, cures the mind or something like that. And Ram Dass realized he's talking about my acid. <laughs> And he had like five acid pills left over from this epic road trip from that he had been on for months from um, Iran all the way up into India or down into India. And he he took one out and said, "You mean this?" And he said, "Yes, this." And uh, he so Ramdas gave him one, and Maharaji said, "More, more." He had him put three in his hand, and he ate them. <laughs> and then he just continued to teach. He had disciples sitting around. He'd often lay in a little wooden bed with a shawl on and hold court, kind of talk to his students and laugh and tell stories. And he said he just continued like nothing happened. And then later, Maharaji said, it's the same, you know, the awakened state is no different than that, you know. It's just phenomenal. There's more stories like that. It's a great audio book. The whole reason I brought this up is because Maharaji gave a beautiful teaching on this very thing of integrating everything into the path. Ramdas tells the story that one day um, Maharaji was out on, sitting under a tree talking to his disciples about life or people were asking questions often it would be very informal and at one point Maharaji said to this woman who was complaining about her life being so filled with suffering and Maharaji turns to her and says I love suffering he said because suffering is an opportunity to learn to grow to Find the source of your well-being. I'm paraphrasing that last part. 
but I just was like, he is, he's a Lojong practitioner. <laughs> he's a master of Lojong, you know, the universal wisdom. And of course I thought, wow, to be able to say, I love suffering. That's pretty advanced. I mean, are we even close to being able to say, I love suffering? <laughs> but I would say, personally, I can speak for myself, no. But at the same time, I look back on my life and I see how suffering has really been one of my greatest teachers. And it's given me an opportunity to grow and become a soulful human being, you know? If we didn't have suffering, we would uh, probably wouldn't, wouldn't have the depth that we have and the capacity to feel uh, the heartbreak of others and help others as well, right? And so Maharaji's teaching, I love suffering, for me is the same as Lognun Tamche Chikija. You know? counter all adversity with a single remedy, like turn towards it. What can we learn from it? And I want to share a story because this is something that often happens with spiritual teachers is they will challenge their students. They will purposefully cause suffering in various ways. Maybe not always, you know, I'm saying like in the ideal situation with a realized master, we'll see that there's some karmas that their students may need to purify or to see like ego fixation, you know, and play with them a little bit to shake them up, rattle the cage and help them break through to a deeper experience of their innermost truth. And one of the greatest stories of this in Tibet is with the um, teacher Marpa, a Tibetan man who was a translator. He studied in India. Legend says that he studied with the great Indian Buddhist saint Nagarjuna. I'm sorry, Naropa, not Nagarjuna. Naropa. And he was the teacher to the great yogi saint Milarepa. So this is 11th century Tibet during the second wave of Buddhism coming to Tibet. It had kind of died off for a couple hundred years and now there was this reemergence of Dharma and teachings coming from India into Tibet. And I want to tell you the story of Milarepa. And what happened was Milarepa experienced a lot of suffering as a child. When he was not too, when he was pretty young, his father died. And his uncle and aunt uh, start, started stealing their money and their grain. The mother was destitute and unfortunately at the time widows were not always protected and they became basically servants in their own home to these evil, this aunt and uncle who were swindling them. And the Milarepa's mother was so bitter and angry that he, she asked him when he was old enough, like 18 or so, to go off and study with this sorcerer up the valley um, and learn how to do black magic so that he could bring redemption, you know, and uh, uh, bring harm to his aunt and uncle. So he did that, and he spent many years studying black magic, learned how to cause hailstorms and fire and control the elements, and I'm sure do many other things. And so when he had gathered up his skills, he came back to his hometown and during a big, I don't know if it's during a wedding or a big social event, he caused a huge uh, flood and killed dozens of people, including his aunt and uncle. And the story goes that afterwards he was maybe wandering, uh, going back to camp or his home somewhere else and looked up at the full moon. And in that moment he realized what he had done and he felt so much remorse that he made a, a vow that I will do anything to purify this horrible karma that I have created. You know, it didn't bring any relief of suffering for me. And I regret it wholeheartedly. And he made that vow to the moon. 
So then he starts wandering, looking for a teacher that can help him find his way out of this horrible suffering that he's created. And he hears of this teacher, Marpa. So he he goes, finds out where he lives. Marpa is married, um, has a farm. And Milarepa asked him, would you teach me dharma? You know, I've done horrible things. And Marpa said, well, may- maybe, maybe. But first, uh, I need some help building a tower up on the on the hilltop over there. We'll see. And Mar- Milarepa says, okay. So Marpa had him carrying heavy rock, stones, up this steep hill, up to the top, and construct this tower. And he has sores on his back. He's bleeding. It's hot. He's, you know, aching uh, every day. He goes to bed exhausted. And then he finally finishes building this this tower. And Marpa said to him, no, it's not right. Tear it down and do it again. (laughs) And so he had him do this manual labor three times until finally until uh, finally he built the one final this multi-storied tower at the top of this hillside it's uh, at a place called Lodrak and it still stands today I've heard and so after this trial uh, Marpa felt that Milarepa had proven his commitment, but also what Marpa said when he accepted Milarepa as a student, he explained to him that all those trials that he put him through, all the suffering, all the hardship, all the adversity that this teacher created for Milarepa, uh, all of that was meant to purify Milarepa's negative karma. And so at that point, Marpa started to teach him. He transmitted uh, various tantric uh, initiations and instructions. Uh, He taught him the inner yogas of Chandali or Tumo, the yogic heat. He gave him oral transmissions and many profound teachings, including Mahamudra, the great seal on the nature of mind, profound teachings. And then he told Milarepa after he had given him all of this to go practice in a solitary meditation retreat cave. And over many, many years of practice and austerities, uh, he really, he's known as, sometimes he's depicted as green because he lived on nettles and he was very thin. And he wore the white shawl. This is a version of that, the yogi shawl, just a simple silk or cotton shawl. And that's all he wore even in the high-altitude snowy mountains of Tibet, because he had mastered the inner heat practices, kundalini, you could say, or tummo in Tibetan. He could live in those extreme environments without uh, much more than a single cloth. So it said many years went by of intensive practice and study, and until finally it resulted in a deep experiential realization about the true nature of reality. He, it is said he achieved Buddhahood. And then he taught many wonderful disciples. They're great stories. One of the most famous um, books, uh, really by him, or called the uh, it's called Hundred Thousand Songs of Milarepa. So he would sing. Often his uh, paintings are he's depicted as having one hand behind his ear and he's singing. He would write poems of realization, and then sing them. That's why I feel like singing is, it, re, singing is really one of one of the paths to awakening. Really, it's 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 not just frivolous. It is really um, when the heart the heart opens, it wants to sing like the birds. And I find that when when we're locked down in the mind and just the baggage of whatever it is, does does not really that substantial when we look at it in the face, but. Um, we, we, we think we don't like singing or we don't sound good, but when you open the heart, the voice is beautiful no matter what you sound like. So Milarepa was a singer. <laughs> he probably would have, if he had a har- harmonium, he might have liked it, playing it. <laughs> In any case, uh, that's the story of Milarepa. I felt that that would be f- helpful in terms of understanding. Like Sometimes we're 
<clears throat> Sometimes we're doing the dishes and we feel like we're wasting our time. But what if you're when you're doing the dishes, you're imagining that you're cleaning any negative karma that you might have within you. Also taking a shower, even they say sitting on the toilet. Imagine that you're just cleansing any negativity, any negative karma. Every activity you do in your life. I've heard a lama say, you know, when you're cleaning your window, imagine you're cleaning your mind, you're cleaning the lens of perception so that you can see more clearly. That really, this path of the great yogis of Tibet and India and China and beyond is about integrating every breath, every moment as your Dharma practice. So that's why this, this phrase of um, Loknan Tamche Chikija is about even those adverse circumstances. Turn the tables on them and integrate them with bodhicitta in your life. Easier said than done, but that's what Dharma is all about. <laughs> One time my t yoga teacher, great teacher, Shandor Remite said to the whole group, or big class, and he's giving a talk, and he said, what do you think the most important thing a teacher does for their students? And I was thinking, oh, to impart wisdom, what I was thinking, going to answer. He said, to inspire, <laughs> to inspire. Hopefully that was inspiring for you. And now I'm going to cut and paste another mantra and we'll go out singing. This is to long life Tara. So we started with the first Tara. And now we're going to end with the 21st Tara. So we're doing the bookend Taras. Uh, this one is a little longer mantra, but I think... One of the main purpose of our project with developing melodies for these mantras is to help people learn them. We learn more easily when we sing a melody to it. So uh, this one is Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mari Che Che Brum Nija Svaha. This is mouth yoga. <laughs> Now this is for Long Life Tara. She's white in color. She's literally her name means Tara Rays of Light, Tara Marichi. And so uh, we're chanting this mantra. You can imagine uh, her in the space in front of you, emanating healing rays of light to you and all beings. Or you can even just feel light everywhere. Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Mariche. Say that. Mari Che, Mari Che, Che. That could be C H E, but it's kind of technically an unaspirated C H. That's Cha, not Cha, Cha. So Mari Che, Che, Brum, Brum is a seed syllable, a Bija mantra, and it's a long life syllable. And many of the long life deities, like Amitayas, different Taras will have brum in their mantras. Brum, brum, brum. Long life. Nrija means a few different things. I'm still trying to figure this one out, but it could mean to bestow or to grant. Svaha, may it be so. So this is for your health, all of our long lives, good health, longevity, and then also for COVID. May her light spread out and bring healing to all those suffering all those encountering COVID and other diseases that threaten our lifespan. So to animals, to humans, to being seen and unseen. Tu tare tu re <coughs> Mari che che brum ri just fa
innovations we make when we're solo in COVID time. <clears throat> Om tare tu tare tu re Mari che che prum rija Om tare tu tare tu re Mari che che prum rija Ma 
Just rest. Feel the Tara starlight, rays of light shining, dispelling any illness in you and all beings everywhere. Close by dedicating the merit for the benefit of all beings near and far, including this being yourself. Offer any positive energy up like a drop of water releasing into the vast ocean of positive energy. It becomes limitless. Offer that up. Thank you. 